Okay. This is Carl. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I hope that you can hear me. Um, this is again uh, Dr. Maria Costa. Um, welcome to the NF Family webinar. This is the second of the uh, series of webinars that um, we are going to present every other month uh, of um, trying to uh, take topics that could be very easy for everybody to understand some of the common problems that many of the families of children with neurofibromatosis has uh, discussed in our clinic very often. Um, I am going to be your moderator for these events. Um, my, nom my name is Maria Costa. I am the clinical director of the Gilbert Family Neurofibromatosis Institute at uh, Children's National Medical Center and I am Associated Professor of Neurology at the George Washington University School of Medicine um, in Washington, D.C., and I have been working in cognition in NS for um, uh, 13 years at this point, and will be um, hosting uh, these webinars and trying to bring some um, information for all of you. Um, uh, the next one. The webinars uh, are going to be scheduled, as I mentioned, every other month. Uh, the dates, the exact dates are a little bit, um, not exactly every two months, try to accommodate some of the holidays or vacations or um, the major holidays, like when a Monday is a holiday, we move it to the next one to be able to have a lot of people uh, coming to that. It means that we will be announcing uh, those in the Facebook page and also so if you have any questions, please contact us and we will be happy to provide any information. The next one. Um, this, uh, uh, the next seminar is going to be, webinar would be about um, social feedback for children. Uh, it's going to be in June 4, next one. The, sec the next one is going to be in July about a school-based service and how to advocate for them, next one. The next one in September is going to be about tips for completing uh, homework, the next one. And the last for this year that we have uh, planned is about uh, how to teach kids to advocate for themselves and their own needs. Um, however, as I said in the first event, we are not having any uh, set uh, um, schedule or set uh, topics. You mean that we uh, can also work with any of the other um, topics. If you are interested or you would like to uh, uh, propose any other topics, we can uh, modify or plan for the future events. Next. Please um, give us your feedback. This is all for you and designed for uh, be useful for all the families that uh, take the time to um, uh, join uh, this, uh, this Mondays um, uh, late afternoon, early evening, and, and pay attention to what we would like to share with all of you. Um, give us feedback, uh, information, subjects, topics that you consider important. Um, the email address, please contact Caitlin T. Plady. The email is there. Or you can email us to directly to the uh, NS Institute at Children's National. We will be more than happy to modify any schedule or any topic or add any topic of your interest. Next. Today, I have the pleasure to introduce all of you Natalie Swartz. She is a wonderful occupational therapist that works at Children's National Medical Center, and who I have the pleasure to work with uh, children with neurofibromatosis, and also I have uh, some um, uh, personal contact with her, and her skills to helping children that need um, health, especially with handwriting tips, and ch children that have difficulties with the proper execution of handwriting um, brought me my attention at how she can uh, share with all of you some strategies that can be useful for all of you to use um, in home uh, based strategies for many of, of the children that, that have these difficulties. Uh, we know that fine motor skills are one of the main problems that many children with neurofibromatosis face, and they get tired and bored uh, writing, and that impacts their ability to express their real cognitive uh, potential. Uh, for that reason, it's really a pleasure for me to uh, have Natalie. I really want to thank you, her, for um, her participation. And um, 
I will let her to start and share with all of you her experience and her um, uh, information to provide these tips for all of you. Natalie. Uh, thank you, Dr. Acosta. That was very nice. Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining me. Uh, like Dr. Acosta said, in tonight's webinar, we will be going over some handwriting tips and tools for children with neurofibromatosis. So Dr. Uh, Acosta already introduced me, but I'm Natalie Swartz. I'm a pediatric occupational therapist at Children's, um, and I ha I'm working with children in both outpatient and inpatient settings, and I have extensive experience working with children um, with ne neurofibromatosis and without it um, to be more efficient with handwriting. All right, so now that I've told you that I'm an occupational therapist, you might be wondering, okay, well, what is occupational therapy? So in the realm of OT, an occupation is not defined as a job, but simply as a meaningful daily activity. The main occupations that we address for children would include playing, learning, socializing, and yep, you guessed it, handwriting. So OTs work with children and their families to help them succeed in these activities and achieve maximal independence with them. So um, we can achieve this in different ways, either with rehabilitative exercises to address the underlying impairments or with activities um, to adapt the environments and tasks to meet the needs of each child. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the many skills needed for handwriting, um, and then I will provide you with some ideas to work on those skills. Um, I will also provide some ideas for specific adaptive equipment and tools that can help your child be successful with handwriting. So on that, um, let's get to it. So handwriting is not as simple as you probably initially think. Um, handwriting does require a combination of cognitive, perceptual, and motor skills. Um, and dysfunction in any of these areas can throw it all off and make it difficult for children to express their thoughts with handwriting. Um, and then this can negatively affect their academic performance, their self-esteem, um, and their frustration tolerance. So um, it's very common for students with handwriting difficulties to be referred to OT either in their school or by their pediatrician um, for help to figure out which skills might need more work and then how we can um, improve those skills. So let's delve deeper into the specifics about how neurofibromatosis affects handwriting. So first of all, I do want to remind you that children with neurofibromatosis type 1 and type 2 will be different, and even children with neurofibromatosis type 1 will be different from other children with neurofibromatosis type 1. Um, so keep that in mind when I'm presenting. Um, I'll start off and let you know that uh, recent studies have suggested that children with neurofibromatosis type 1 um, may have challenges in each area, in cognitive, perceptual, and motor functioning that will affect their handwriting skills. Um, so knowing that, I, I want to give you a brief overview of um, each one of these areas so you can think about which skills might be strengths for your child with their handwriting and which skills um, your child might be struggling with and might be leading them to be more frustrated or refusing um, handwriting activities. So first, um, let's go over the cognitive skills. So language and intelligence help us form the content for handwriting, um, but what a lot of people often miss and that are extremely important for handwriting are a higher level set of cognitive processes known as executive functioning. So executive functioning is a set of mental processes that helps connect past experience with present action um, to execute activities. So this will include impulse control, which is the ability to inhibit your impulses. Um, your ability to be flexible and shift from one thought to another during an activity, um, the ability to control your emotions, initiate actions, retain pertinent information in your working memory, um, plan sequences, uh, organize materials, and then monitor your own performance. All of these skills impact your ability to finish assignments and engage in handwriting. And a recent study found that the most key executive functioning skill of all of these for handwriting was actually the monitoring skill, um, which includes the ability to check for errors and evaluate your own handwriting. Now let's discuss visual perceptual skills that are needed for legible handwriting. So visual perceptual skills are a group of skills that are needed for children to be able to process and visually make sense of the world around them, which would include letters and numbers needed for handwriting. 
So the ability to recognize an object, letter, or number, even when all of the parts or details are not present or parts of them are missing, is known as visual closure. This is extremely important for finishing jigsaw puzzles, um, and it comes into play with reading. Um, the ability to attend to or search for a specific target while simultaneously ignoring irrelevant information, that is, being able to find an object in a busy background, um, is known as figure ground. And this is important for reading and handwriting, especially when assignments become longer and there's more information on the page that needs to be sorted through. Um, the ability to recognize different objects, letters, or numbers, um, in including the differences in size, color, or orientation, is known as visual discrimination. So this skill um, helps us with letter sizing, discerning between uppercase and lowercase, and with general overall neatness of handwriting. Visual memory is the ability to remember an object or letter and recognize it quickly when you see it again. So visual memory plays a big part in just first learning and recalling the different letters and numbers, and then continues to be important with copying and taking notes later in life. Um, the ability to remember a sequence of objects, numbers, or letters in the order that they were originally presented um, is known as visual sequential memory. And as you can imagine, this skill is integral for spelling. Okay. Um, so now let's move on to the next set of skills, which are known as the visual spatial skills. And these help us understand how our body relates to space. So the two skills that you need for good spatial awareness are laterality and directionality. Laterality is the internal awareness of left and right and of two sides of the body. Um, and it requires good balance, vestibular function, and a general awareness that your body has a midline. Um, directionality is takes it a step further and is the understanding of left and right, but then incorporates up, down, in front of, behind, over, under, and so on. Um, and it also takes it to the next step of not just understanding how those relate to yourself, but how they apply out into space. So if your child is struggling with laterality, you might notice that they don't hold on to the paper with their non-dominant hand, they switch hands or when they were younger or first learning, um, they might not have chosen a dominant side very quickly. Um, and they might also rotate their body or turn to reach things that are across from them rather than reach across. Um, and with directionality, you might see some differences with um, letter reversals. You could see some, some struggling with B and D um, and trouble spacing letters and words. All right, I hope I'm not overwhelming you guys. Just want to do a brief background. So now let's talk about the motor skills that you need for handwriting. So the most important are obviously fine motor coordination, strength, and visual motor integration. So fine motor coordination involves the use of small muscles of our hands and includes being able to figure out how much force to use, which is known as pressure gradation, um, being able to move your fingers separately, which is known as finger isolation, and being able to move the two sides of your hand separately, which is known as radial ulnar dissociation. That just basically means being able to keep your last two fingers still and anchored while moving your first three fingers to coordinate, say, a pencil or a feeding utensil. Um, if your child is having trouble with radial ulnar dissociation, you might notice that they move their whole arm as one unit while they're writing, um, or they might keep their wrist in the air instead of keeping it stabilized onto the paper. And then muscle strength um, from your hands all the way to your core really affects um, a child's precision and control during handwriting. So the stronger and more stable that you are at your joints, the easier it is to control those fine motor movements. And lastly, we have visual motor integration, which more simply just means hand-eye coordination. And that's our ability to coordinate what our eyes see with how our, re our hands react, like with catching a ball or writing on a line. All right, now that we've learned about all the skill sets that you need for handwriting, I want to go over some actions that you can take to improve these specific skills. Hopefully, you're already beginning to think about which skills your child might be struggling with. Um, 
And I do want you to keep in mind that most of these actions are actually not themselves related to handwriting, but they will assist building the skills needed for handwriting. Um, also, for your convenience, I've created handouts with all of these ideas that you can have access to after the presentation and um, you might have already downloaded. Um, because And because I'm providing those handouts, I'm not going to specifically discuss every activity on the slides just for time's sake. So first, let's go over some ideas to improve pressure gradation, which is um, under the fine motor skill realm. If your child frequently breaks their pencils or writes so lightly that you can barely, barely see it, then these ideas might be for you. So you can have your child paint with an eyedropper, pick up fragile objects with tweezers, tongs, or their fingers in a pincer grasp, um, draw or trace on tissue paper without ripping it, ripping it or line up dominoes on their end. Next are some ideas for finger isolation and rotation, again, in the fine motor skill realm. Um, these will be helpful if you notice your child dropping small items frequently or if when they're, when they're counting on fingers, they might really struggle with that. So that could be a sign that finger isolation is impacted. Um, during these activities, you want to definitely make sure that your child is not adjusting the pieces with their other hand or pressing it into their body to turn them, um, as that will really eliminate the need for rotation or finger isolation um, and won't be beneficial. So you can play games with small pegs or coins, such as Battleship, Mancala, or Lightbright, and encourage your child to pick up more than one piece at a time so that they really have to move it around in their hand. Um, hold a flat object like a book or a plate on their um, extended fingers and then have them rotate that object around on their fingertips without dropping it or without bending their fingers. Um, another good idea that kids love is crumpling paper into little balls um, then you can add some of hand-eye coordination into that and have them throw it into a target or a container. Um, the last finer, fine motor skill area I want to talk about is uh, the radial ulnar dissociation, which is that ability to separate the two sides of the hand. So to improve radial ulnar dissociation, you can try having your child um, place some golf tees into a foam block so that they're standing up, and then have them balance marbles on each tee. You can make it more challenging by giving your child more marbles at a time that they have to hold in their hand. Um, you can also have them roll small balls of Play-Doh um, between their thumb and index finger and then have them pinch them to flatten them out. Again, during these activities, you want to make sure that the pinky and the ring finger are curled into the palm and not extended out. Now um, are some ideas for improving wrist and hand strength. So if your child is showing signs of weakness like having a loose or improper pencil grip um, or they're fatiguing very quickly with writing, these activities might help with their hand and wrist strength. So you can have them squeeze a stress ball or therapy putty. Um, you can have them write or paint on a vertical surface that's placed above their eye level um, so that they have to reach up and extend their wrist. Or you can have them wring out clothes or sponges. And just remember to make it fun um, and exciting for your child. Oops, sorry. All right, now let's go on. Um, to some activities for shoulder strength. So if your child is keeping their elbow up in the air instead of stable at their side during handwriting or cutting, um, that's a good sign that they might have shoulder weakness also. Um, so to incorporate shoulder strengthening, you can have them carry heavy objects around the house, play catch with a weighted ball, wheelbarrow walks, monkey bars, um, basically any activity where they are required to use large arm movements from the shoulder or are weight bearing through their arms into their shoulder. Also, if your child is slouching or propping a lot on their elbows, laying their head down on their desk, um, then they might have some core weakness going on that's also affecting their handwriting. Um, so some of my favorite core strengthening exercises are doing inchworms, which is where you have them squat and put their hands on the ground, then they keep their feet planted and walk their hands out into a plank. Then they hold their, their, and plant their hands there and walk their feet back into them. Um, you can make it fun, be a competition, whatever you want to do to 
um, motivate your child to do that. And then also the Superman pose is very effective for core strengthening. Um, you might even do that in your gym routine. So what you do is you lay on your stomach, you lift your head, your arms, your shoulders, your legs, and your thighs while keeping your arms and legs straight. And uh, try and see if you, how long you can have kids hold that position. Just for your reference, um, to also help you figure out if core strengthening might be an issue, um, here's a, a picture of what we would expect for good posture with handwriting. We want the hips and the knees at 90 degrees with the feet flat on the ground, um, and the writing surface at about chest level. So the child should have a slight round in their shoulders, but not leaning on the desk and not with a hunchback. Um, and they should be stabilizing the paper with their non-dominant hand. Um, and using what's known as a tripod grasp, which means that they have the pencil between their thumb and first two fingertips with the last two fingers curled into their palm. Um, the pencil should also be resting back on the first knuckle um, and not straight up in the air. All right, so let's keep moving with some more activities. Um, these are some activities to improve hand-eye coordination. So if your child's having trouble keeping their letters on the line or you've noticed that they have trouble copying shapes, letters, or numbers, um, you can try some of these activities to improve their hand-eye coordination. So you can have them pop bubbles with only their index finger, trace letters in shaving cream, string beads, practice cutting on the lines with different shapes, um, play basketball, these are all good ideas for hand-eye coordination. Now, if your child is having trouble with specifically with letter sizing, reversals, letter spacing, or um, keeping their letters on the lower line, um, then they might be having they might need some ideas for visual spatial skills. So, if you recall, these are the skills that help ch children learn left, right up and down, and in order to develop them, you need to have balance, a movement sense, and the idea of a midline. So I know some of these um, look like they're not really related to handwriting or visual skills at all, um, but they really do help with that, that spatial awareness. So you can have them do jumping jacks, windmills, cross crawls, which means that they, they march and they reach one arm across and touch the knee of the opposite leg. Um, you can have them jump on a trampoline while they play I spy, um, bowling in different body positions, so upside down, on their side, on an unstable surface. That will all help. And now let's move on to the visual perceptual skills. So I've broken them down into five smaller skill sets um, just because there are so many. So to improve figure ground skills, which are those skills that will help with skimming when you're reading and will help with the ability to complete longer worksheets and focus on one problem at a time, would be playing Where's Waldo or hidden pictures or setting up scavenger hunts in your house um, for kids to find objects in busy backgrounds. Um, for children who have a harder time completing visual pictures in their mind, um, which is their visual closure skills, then you can try doing connect the dots, try using jigsaw puzzles, um, and again, just make it at their just right level so that it's a, a challenge for them, but not too hard. Um, and then to improve visual discrimination, which is your ability to know the difference between um, sizes, orientation, and colors, you can have your child play spot the difference or with parquetry blocks. Um, two of the most important visual perceptual skills for handwriting would definitely be the visual memory and visual sequential memory piece. Um, they help with letter recall, copying from a stimulus, or taking notes. Um, and to improve visual memory, is a really fun game where you can place 3D letters or really any objects onto a tray and give your child about 10 to 15 seconds to memorize them. Then cover them up and take away one or two at a time and, when you, and then show them back to the child and see if they can guess um, which items were removed. Again, make it harder or easier based on your child. Um, and then to target the visual sequential memory, um, you can have them play that old school Simon game. Sorry, um, where they where lights um, flash and then they have to remember the sequence that they go in and replicate that sequence. Okay. 
And lastly, this is the one um, that most children are struggling with during handwriting is executive functioning. Um, so if your child is having trouble staying seated, if they're having trouble organizing the writing content, even though they know what they want to say, um, if they're unable to correct their own mistakes or they're getting stuck during handwriting, um, those can all be signs of difficulties with executive functioning skills. Um, so first I'm going to go over some activities that can improve the underlying executive functioning, and then I'm going to go through some suggestions and ways to support executive functioning in the child's environment. Um, so you can have one of, one of my favorite things to do with kids to improve their monitoring is to have them evaluate first your performance or a sibling's performance with handwriting and then eventually be able to move to evaluating their own performance with handwriting. So you want to have them do things like circle errors or highlight errors or um, give checks to words or letters that they perceive as being extra correct. Um, you can play strategy games like um, Gravity Maze, Monopoly, or Rush Hour, those are three of my top favorites. Um, and then one really excellent tool that you can use is um, something that's called the Superflex Curriculum from socialthinking.com. And this curriculum is specifically designed for kids who are six and older and teaches them about different social behaviors and expectations using superheroes and villains. So for example, it teaches children about Meditation Matt, who is a superhero to help you have a calm body, and um, his plight versus Energy Harry, who gives you tons of energy and makes you fidget. It's just a really fun way to help kids think about how to control themselves. So um, some ideas to support executive function during handwriting are um, pretty simple, remove distractions um, and keep them in a quiet environment. Sometimes that's hard to do, but it's really important. Um, help students organize their time and, and learn just about time management in general. So have them practice estimating how long an assignment will take and then have them time it and then compare how long they thought it would take to how long it actually did take. Um, have them use checklists, planners, timelines, um, different things to keep them organized. And also it's really important to remember to build in downtime and take breaks when they're needed. So the best case scenario would be 35 minutes on a task and five minutes off for some form of aerobic activity or some calming break. Um, you really want to pay attention to your child's sensory system and figure out um, what calms them, maybe it's heavy work, maybe it's aerobic activity, um, and kind of figure out the signs too that they're getting to that point where they're too overstimulated to function and um, really do need to have a break to help them. All right, so now that we've discussed the strategies and actions um, to improve foundational handwriting skills, I have some suggestions for um, adaptive handwriting tools that can help your child achieve the good handwriting. Um, and these tools will really help your child be more successful um, with handwriting while working to address the underlying impairment. So first is the slant board. The slant board is designed to help with better postural alignment um, and allow for more stability and in turn better control and legibility of handwriting. Um, the crossover grip, which you'll see the first one here, um, is ideal for kids that wrap their thumbs or fingers around the pencil, um, which stops them from achieving good finger isolation and fluid writing, writing movements. So the wings that you see on that grip um, stop them from crossing their fingers over top of each other. Next is the claw. Um, this is ideal um, for kids that just need some extra help to get into that correct position. Um, it's just a claw-like design that gently holds the fingers in the right position, um, and it can produce better handwriting and control. The last one is the handy writer. Um, so this one is ideal for kids that are using maybe more than three fingers on the pencil or moving their whole arm as a unit versus just their fingers during handwriting. So the child basically has a small charm that they hold under the fourth and fifth digits um, that attaches back to the pencil um, on a chain and goes over their wrist. So it pulls 
the pencil back into their web space and anchors it onto their first knuckle um, and just helps them get that better grasp. Some ideas for older kids um, are using a weighted pencil or a vibrating pencil. Um, so a weighted pencil is ideal if your child has a loose grasp or puts too much pressure on the pencil. So it just adds a little extra feedback to improve control and legibility. Um, and the vibrating pencil is really ideal for kids that have trouble focusing. So the vibration, the texture of the um, grip there, and there's a little extra weight in it also helps increase focus and concentration um, and decrease the grip force used on the pencil. There are also a number of um, adaptive papers that you can use for helping children that have visual perceptual and visual motor deficits. So these include paper that has race lines, tri-lined paper, so paper with three lines, um, that have accompanying visual cues, and also um, just simply highlighting the paper. So paper with raised lines is ideal for children who have low impulse control or impaired hand-eye coordination and need the physical bump into the line to help them stop their letters and place their letters correctly. Tri-lined paper with visual cues is ideal for younger children who have difficulty with hand-eye coordination and or directionality. Um, they just use color cues with um, clouds and grass to help them understand and discriminate between top, middle, and bottom. And then the highlighted paper really helps um, with kids who have difficulty with figure ground um, and visual memory. Also um, helpful with handwriting are considering different seating options. So when you're trying to choose seating options for your child, keep in mind um, that ideal posture that I showed you and figure out, oh, does my child need a harder chair with no cushion? Do they need armrests, a backrest, not a backrest? Do they need to sit in the bed and use a lap pad? Um, play around with it and just help your child achieve the ideal posture. You can use a balance cushion, which is this first picture here, um, to help a child that fidgets or seeks movement. Um, and a weighted lap pad, as seen on the right, can help children that like to prop or drape their bodies on surfaces and really need some extra pressure to stay calm. Um, splinting is also an option. So this splint here is called an oval eight finger splint. Um, and it's, avail it's available across the market if you just do an internet search as all of these things that I've shown you are. Um, and it's ideal if your child is double jointed or has very lax joints. Um, so you can use them to provide some stability for control and hand strength. Another adaptive handwriting strategy is actually just to go ahead and move away from handwriting in general. So typing in general is a good and functional alternative to handwriting in some cases. Um, the makers of Handwriting Without Tears actually created a program called Keyboarding Without Tears um, that can assist children to make this transition. So you'll want to talk with your child's school about these options, as many schools have specific devices or typing programs that they can loan to children who need to use typing as an alternative to handwriting. Um, another another uh, adaptive strategy is to use an iPad. So this is especially helpful for adolescents and older children um, that need to be taking notes in class. Um, there are some standard iPad features under the keyboard settings that can help them from the get-go, including dictation, predictive text, and auto-correction, um, and something called shortcuts, which is um, where they can create custom phrases that they just link to abbreviations, and then when they type the abbreviations, the whole um, phrase shows up. There's also a number of helpful iPad apps that I found to help work on letter formation and improve visual perceptual and visual spatial skills for handwriting, and those are I Write Words, Handwriting Without Tears, and Letter School. I just really recommend if you're going to try these that you use a stylus instead of the child's fingers. Um, this way you'll incorporate the coordination and control of using the writing tool and the motor memory created will be more applicable to handwriting than if you were using their fingers. Um, for the older children and adolescents, audio note can help them um, take notes in class and record what they're hearing. 
Um, I really encourage you to just kind of look around the app store and spend some time getting to know these apps to determine if they're right for your child. So that being said, now that we've done a quick and dirty rundown of handwriting skills and some things that you can do to help your child, you might be wondering, well, what if I still think that I need more help? So if your child is really having more than just a little trouble with their handwriting and their poor handwriting is limiting their academic performance and their grades or self-esteem are truly impacted, a full OT evaluation might be warranted. Um, since OT can also help with achieving independence and functional activities in general, you might want to consider an OT referral if your child's motor, perceptual, or executive functioning issues are limiting their independence with self-care activities like dressing or self-feeding. So if I've convinced you and you've decided that you would like to pursue an OT evaluation, um, now you might be wondering, well, how can I get more help? So, if you're interested in getting an OT evaluation, you can either ask your school or your doctor about an OT referral. Um, your child's school can have an OT perform an evaluation of handwriting and make goals for handwriting as part of their IEP if deemed necessary. Um, if they don't require an IEP, you can also ask your school to implement a 504 plan with handwriting accommodations um, for your school to adhere to. If your child doesn't qualify for school services or they have needs that really go beyond academic performance, um, then it might be more appropriate to seek outpatient OT services. Um, and these services are usually covered by insurance, but you'll just have to work with your individual plans and just keep in mind that you'll also need um, a doctor's referral. So um, also there are some really great resources on the internet that you can go to for more help. Um, there's a wonderful support group and forum with the NS network. Um, and there's not a local chapter as far as I could find, but the national support network um, still covers you and there's lots of really great resources on that website, so I encourage you to check it out. Um, if you really want just specific handwriting information, um, handwriting without tears and keyboarding without tears are two of my go-tos. Um, and then there's a wonderful website called Therapy Fun Zone, and they have a whole handwriting blog post where they talk about a lot of the things that I just talked about, and they give you even more in-depth activities with pictures and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and some specific OT blogs um, for more creative ideas on motor, perceptual, and executive functioning activities are Mama OT, The Inspired Treehouse, and I Can Learn. Um, I really thank you all for coming and listening, and I hope that it was helpful. Thank you. I'll turn it over thank to you now. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, the... thank you. okay, thank you, Natalie. This is so fantastic. I really, really appreciate all the information that you provide. I want to make a couple of, of comments before that I go um, in um, some uh, questions uh, uh, and also uh, some additional information. I think that we have time for questions. Um, if people want to type some questions, uh, Natalie will be happy to do uh, some um, answers for the questions. Probably it will be easier to type those questions um, for her to address those for everybody. A uh, couple of things. I really want uh, you all, it's a lot of information. You can see that Natalie was very, very, um, uh, has a lot of information for the different uh, uh, possibilities that can affect handwriting. Uh, one thing that I told the parents in, 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 in the clinic is remember that many things that you can incorporate in your daily routines is games, play activities, and if you see many of the activities that she mentioned at the beginning, it's just to have fun with the kids. Me that you, um, this is not, not any of these uh, webinars um, mean to be a replacement of a professional consultation, as uh, Natalie uh, described. Um, if you have concerns, talk to, to your physician, talk to your doctor, and request an evaluation for occupational therapy. 
and they can provide you more specific uh, information of your specific case. But in the meantime, there are so many things that you can do with your kids that can help to improve many of these areas, from baking cookies to plant the chopping list to just play with Play-Doh, uh, play uh, Monopoly, play with Kenga, any of the activities that she mentioned uh, will be um, part of a therapeutic plan and what about making fun and have a lot of uh, good time with your kids that at the same time makes you to feel that it's helping also to achieve some of the goals. Um, this is important to, to keep in mind. Also in terms of all the uh, last uh, recommendations, uh, uh, learn about all the different accommodations that you can discuss with your school. Um, my experience is that many of the schools are very open to discuss those accommodations. If you learn very well how to, those can be incorporated in the, in the academic performance and the academic plan for the kids. And we will be talking more about how to uh, manage and how to plan for an IEP or 504 plan in, in, in other uh, situations. Um, um, before we go into the, 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 the question, uh, we will be able to have some handouts with all this information, probably it's a lot to be able to uh, remember everything. Uh, if you would like to have those uh, handouts uh, from this uh, webinar, please email us and we will be more than happy to uh, have uh, those emailed you back um, uh, with all the information. Uh, also, we will um, have our inner family uh, day on April 7, uh, where we are going to have a very fun event with a lot of activities for parents and children, and we are trying to make this a very uh, fantastic day uh, with some information for parents. We were talking about the latest research in MEC inhibitors, autism, uh, optic nerve gliomas, um, uh, coaching and non-pharmacological strategies for learning disabilities and all our research at Children's National. But most important, we want to have a, a very fun day with a lot of activities for parents and children. And we have been working very hard to make that an event uh, full of uh, um, opportunities for chair with all of you. Uh, please register. The event is going to be at Children's National. The information is in the flyer and also in, play, in Facebook. We need you guys to register to be able to plan properly for food and, um, and the fun activities and also for the auditorium. Um, um, uh, this is uh, how to register for the uh, family day and uh, also the Facebook um, that is also available uh, for uh, the event. The next one. And this um, webinar and also the Family Day is partially sponsored by Children's Tumor Foundation. Uh, we all know how much uh, Children's Tumor Foundation support many of the activities that are related with uh, the neurofibromatosis family. And now I will open uh, for questions that anybody can have for Natalie. And again, Natalie, thank you so much for doing this. I know that it's a lot of information and I'm sure that will help a lot of families and patients. Great, thank you.
Um, yeah, so um, thank you, Dr. Acosta. Um, for um, Dr. Acosta is wondering for a little more detail about um, the pencil grips that I talked about um, and how they actually help with handwriting. So um, the crossover grip, like I mentioned, the one that stops you from crossing your fingers over and wrapping it, um, that helps you so that you can move your fingers more independently um, from your arm and from your wrist so that your movements are more precise and then um, your handwriting is more in control. It also gives you a little bit of a wider surface, um, so you have to use a little less hand strength in order to um, coordinate your movements. And it can really make a big difference for a lot of kids in how legible and how neat their handwriting is. Um, the, the pencil that had the weight on it, so what happens is um, when you have something that's weighted, it gives more feedback to your motor systems and um, to your brain so that um, you kind of recruit more resources. So for a kid that is pushing too hard or not pushing hard enough, um, it just brings some more awareness to their hand in general so that they can write more fluidly. Um, and it also, it can just uh, be a little more of a calming thing um, when kids get deep pressure, like think of getting a hug or um, jumping on a trampoline or pushing into something. A lot of times that's very calming um, because it kind of re releases um, some chemicals like endorphins and things in your brain that, that help you focus um, and pay attention a little bit better. Another thing, too, about those um, pencil grips that's helpful to use and some of those tools that I talked about is that a lot of those um, really are aimed at just helping the motor skills and helping children um, have an easier time with whether it be their strength or their fine motor coordination. So they have to spend um, less cognitive skills or less cognitive attention on the fine motor skills of it and how to hold their posture and how to hold their pencil. Um, and they can use more of that cognition towards what they're going to write and how they're going to organize it. Um, so that can help a lot for kids. Um, so also, I'm getting another question about um, kids feeling that writing on iPad is easier than writing with pencil and paper, um, and just wondering if that is a good option for older kids. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful option for older children. Um, and like I said, that audio note um, app that I looked at, is it's really wonderful. Um, the kids can record what their um, teacher is saying, and they can um, add in points where they want to take notes, so it will just kind of flag it, and then they can go back later to where they put a flag, um, and they can take notes from there by listening to it. Um, they can also use their stylus, um, and sometimes, um, I think in that audio app, um, audio note app they can do this, but also I think there are other apps that do this where um, the student could take a picture of the teacher's outline or the teacher could email the student their outline and then um, you can just upload it into the app and then the student can take notes um, onto the outline and add it straight onto there. Um, so that really is an excellent option and it's a really good thing to talk to your schools about because even if you don't have an iPad at home or if you're worried about sending your personal iPad to school with your child, many schools have grants for these things um, and they, they have tried out all of these different apps and they have people that specialize in it that can help your, your kid get started with it. So um, if you're interested in note taking, especially for older kids um, and using an iPad, I would definitely talk with your school about it. Okay, and now, okay, so I just got another question about 
Um, how early can parents identify that their children may be having difficulties with handwriting and what are some red flags? And that's an excellent question. Um, so you can see delays with fine motor, executive functioning, and perceptual skills even before handwriting starts. Um, and since those are the foundational skills, if they are already having trouble with that, then you can be pretty sure that that handwriting will become difficult for them. So the earlier that we start um, helping with these things, the better. So if your child is having trouble doing puzzles, that's one um, big thing to look for with visual perceptual skills. Uh, with executive functioning, maybe, you know, you take them out to the playground and you notice that, that they have a much harder time engaging in some reciprocal play. They prefer things like chase or tag. Um, maybe with strength at the playground, you might notice that they are having a harder time climbing ladders um, or keeping up with other kids. You might notice that they prefer to play with cars or something while they're sitting down or laying down instead of um, being a little more active. You can also see delays with um, just making shapes. So they should be making shapes like circles, squares, lines, um, doing things like cutting. All of that comes before handwriting. So if they're having any trouble with those things, if they're having trouble holding their spoon or their fork when they're feeding themselves, um, that those can all be early signs uh, that there are some fine motor or visual um, delays that they might need to start working on some of these activities for. Um, and like I, I mentioned, those OT blogs actually, um, specifically, I'm sorry, um, the OT blog Mama OT, she has really, really wonderful tips for um, kind of that early intervention crowd, that pre-handwriting stage. Um, and Handwriting with Tears also um, has a program that's called Get Set for School, um, and that's before you even really start handwriting and you're just learning about letters, and it's a, um, a whole wonderful program where you can um, do some different multi-sensory activities to learn about letters. Okay, so on that topic, someone just asked um, if I could give an example of some multi-sensory activities. Um, so this would include um, writing letters and shaving cream. You can make a bin or use a cookie sheet and put sand or rice in it. Um, and then again, draw with your finger, draw with a, a paintbrush or any sort of dowel um, and try to have them um, copy letters or make letters in there. Um, you can also try, um, you can yourself draw a letter and then use Elmer's glue, not a glue stick, but actual glue um, to trace over top of it and then let it dry and it will create um, a bumpy surface so you can have the, the children trace their fingers over top of that um, in order to start learning the letter formation and get familiar with that. Um, some more uh, options are using Play-Doh or therapy putty um, and rolling it out into um, kind of like a stick or a log shape um, and then having kids um, connect those um, to make different letters or shapes um, and you can help them with that as much as they need. You can use things like you could draw a shape on a piece of paper and then have them place the Play-Doh on top of those lines um, to make the shape. Um, they're really 
if you can think of it, you can do it. You can also draw a letter or a shape on a piece of paper and have them put coins on top of the outline to make the shape. Um, you can have them ball up tissue paper and then glue it onto the shape in the outline. Um, really anything where they're making letters or shapes, but they're not actually using a pencil or a crayon or anything um, to make the letters. They're just getting that idea and building those perceptual sign motor and um, hand-eye coordination skills during it. Um, something fun, too, for a multi-sensory activity for older kids, um, or if you have multiple kids, too, this is really fun. Um, try having them lay out their bodies so that they make different letters, um, like one person is the stick and one person might be the, the round part of a letter P, um, or have them even try to turn their bodies into like a K by holding up one arm in a diagonal. Um, that's something fun to do for older kids for multisensory activities. Well, we have, yes, a few more minutes. Um, I would like to thank again, Natalie, for um, this wonderful presentation. Again, it's a lot of information. I feel that um, she has been giving uh, great ideas. Again, many adults are really fun activities to be done with, um, with children at home. Um, Please email us if you would like to have handouts with a lot of the information that Natalie just presented in the webinar. Uh, send us information about the webinars, the subjects, the presentations. If you would like us to modify the format or the content, um, this is all for you. Um, and we would like that all of you enjoy it and take some advantage of this time that we and all of you are investing to spend one hour together um, every other month. Um, again, thank you so much. I hope that uh, we can see many of you on April the 7th. And have a good evening. And again, thank you, Natalia, and thank you for everybody that uh, joined us today. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.